Hello everyone, I'm Stephanie Beckler with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with E3 Analytics. Today's webinar is focused on, the, on designing successful renewable energy targets in Africa, key principles and insights. Uh, one important note of mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practice resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Before we begin, I'll go over some of the webinar features. For audio, we have two options. Uh, you may either listen through your computer or over the telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Uh, doing so will eliminate the possibility of any feedback or echo. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option, and a box to the right will display the telephone number and the audio pin you should use to dial in. And uh, if anyone has technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259 3826 for assistance. If you'd like to ask a question during the webinar, and we encourage that you do, we ask you to use the questions pane uh, where you can type that in. If you are having difficulty viewing the webinar materials through the portal, you can find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you may follow along as our speakers present. Uh, also, on an audio recording and the presentations will be posted to the Solutions Center training page within a few weeks, and they'll be added to the Solutions Center's YouTube channel, where you can find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Uh, today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentation from our guest panelist, Toby Couture. Toby has been kind enough to join us to focus on what policymakers and regulators across Africa can do to design more effective targets as they seek to scale up the share of renewable energy in the mix and attract private investment, drawing on examples from within Africa as well as from around the world. Uh, before Toby begins his presentation, we'll provide a short overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. And then following the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session where panelists uh, where Toby will address questions submitted by the audience. Then we will have some closing remarks and a brief survey. This slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center came to be. The Solution Center is one of 13 initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial that was launched in April of 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. The outcomes of this unique initiative include support of developing countries and emerging economies through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools, such as the webinar you are attending today. The Solution Center has four primary goals. It serves as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. It also serves to share best policy practices, data, and analysis, tools uh, specific to clean energy policies and programs. The Solution Center delivers dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And lastly, the, the Center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. Our primary audience is energy policymakers and analysis from uh, governments and technical organizations and countries, but we strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. A marquee feature of the Solution Center provides a no-cost expert policy assistance program known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert program has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. Uh, for example, in the area of sustainable energy policy design and laws, we are very pleased to have Chad Laurent. He's a senior consultant and general counsel with the Meister Consultants Group, Inc. So he serves as one of our experts. If you have a need for policy assistance in sustainable energy policy design or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, the assistance is provided free of charge, and if you have any questions for our experts, 
please submit it through our simple online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. Uh, we also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. Now I'd like to provide a brief introduction for today's panelist. Toby Couture is the founder and director of E3 Analytics, an international renewable energy consultancy based in Berlin, Germany. He works on a wide range of topics in renewable energy, including policy and regulatory analysis, market research, strategy consulting, and finance. He has worked extensively with policymakers and regulators on renewable energy strategy and has advised over 40 national governments around the world. And with that introduction, I would like to welcome Toby to the webinar. Thank, thanks, Stephanie. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, the topic for today's webinar is designing renew successful renewable energy targets in Africa. And I'm going to try to break the presentation down essentially into two different components. So if we're lucky, I'll try to keep the first half of the presentation roughly for the actual presentation and then save the second half or the second 45 minutes for a uh, question and answer period. So without further ado, let me dive in. So first, I'll start off with a brief summary of the presentation. The second, provide an introduction. The, the second uh, aspect, we'll look at the functions of targets. So what are the different roles that targets play? The third part, we'll look specifically at how to design targets. And I'll outline seven core principles for how to make targets successful in Africa. And I'll conclude with some brief concluding remarks. So a brief summary. Renewable energy targets have been adopted in over 160 countries worldwide. There are 54 countries in total in Africa, of which 42 currently have registered uh, renewable energy targets, either in the form of um, specific policy or strategy announcements, renewable energy action plans, or integrated resource plans that have targets bundled within them. Um, but ultimately, if you look across the map, both of Africa and around the world, the actual number of countries that have targets isn't ultimately as important. The underpinning structure, the policies and regulations and administrative structures that support those targets uh, in practice. So if you look around the world, actually many renewable energy targets are having very little or even no impact on renewable energy growth, investment, or deployment. So this is what I've started to call paper targets. There's an expression in English that refers to paper tigers. Um, and I think in this context, it's really important to distinguish from between substantive renewable energy targets that are actually making a difference in the market by mobilizing finance, by leading to project deployment, and those that are just there on paper. And that's a distinction we'll, I'll pick up again on through the presentation. This map uh, comes from a recent report uh, that I co helped co-author with staff at IRENA last year that provided the first global overview of renewable energy targets. And this provides the global map uh, of targets as of mid-2015. So you can see the spread is quite wide. Uh, most of the world, as I mentioned, and, over 160 countries have some form of target, um, and the number continues to grow. In order to be successful, targets need rely on a host of complementary policies. In other words, a target in, it, in and of itself is not a implementation policy. It provides the objective, but fundamentally there's a need for complementary policies in order to get that target to lead to concrete investments in, in a given market. So, so I've, I've listed a few of these here. For example, uh, clear power purchase agreements. 
some form of currency protection. Uh, you can see this in the case of Ghana currently with its IPP program. Credit support for various off-taker agreements. So in order to improve the overall credit standing of the particular uh, financing arrangements in place. So you can find this currently in Uganda under the Get Fit program that's currently underway. Another form of policy support is, or policy sort of implementation related policy, is providing explicit compensation or an explicit regulatory framework for curtailment or undelivered power. Um, you can see this in the most recent rounds of the renewable energy uh, IPP program in South Africa that's been launched a couple of years ago and has proven to be quite quite successful. Another component is inflation indexation in the power purchase agreement contracts. So some of these things are essential in order to help implement the actual target in order to get investment to happen in the first place and in order to establish some of the administrative permitting and grid connection related procedures that are necessary in order to attract that investment. So at a, taking a step back, as I mentioned at the outset, a renewable energy target itself is not going to suddenly make an uninvestable market investable. But they do remain important in anchoring the overall policy and regulatory framework and in providing a long-term signal to stakeholders. In a related sense, targets can also help put countries on the map by helping signal that there's opportunity, that there's potential for um, project-related investment in a given country. And for many countries in Africa that haven't benefited or haven't been able to tap into foreign direct investment, uh, a target can be an important way to help draw attention and uh, potentially attract finance to some of those investments. So now, Let's dive in. There are currently many African countries that have adopted various forms of RE targets. As I mentioned, we have integrated resource plans that have targets bundled within them. Uh, there are also energy master plans that provide or include some form of renewable energy target. And there are also regional initiatives, for example, in the ECOWAS region with ECRI that have been successful in creating regional templates for renewable energy targets across the region. And perhaps the most sort of far-reaching initiative to try to push these targets forward has been the recent SE for All process to try to get some of these di different countries from across Africa to adopt concrete agendas and to start implementing the kinds of policies and regulations necessary to scale up in the years ahead. One fact that becomes clear from looking across the landscape and looking across the various uh, tenders that have taken place in, in different markets, not only in Africa, but also around the world, is that renewables are increasingly cost competitive. And investors and lenders are increasingly looking at Africa's renewable energy sector for potential investment opportunities. And on the one hand, I think it, it would be fair to say that there's quite a bit of, uh, of hope and optimism about the prospects. But at the same time, there's a bit of a, bit of a cautious uh, undertone to a lot of the discussions, trying to see how, how bankable the individual markets are, what kinds of risks might uh, derail investments in the years ahead. And I think there's particularly recently with the most um, many currencies across Africa having depreciated significantly in value, there's much greater attention on, in particular, the currency related. Uh, indexation provisions of power purchase agreements in order to protect against some of those macroeconomic uh, shocks that are taking place. So there is going to be increasing interest on the one hand, but I think also with that interest comes much greater scrutiny. Uh, scrutiny of specifics of the policies and regulations, scrutiny of the very uh, the intricacies of the power purchase agreements and that scrutiny is likely to bring uh, over time to help improve the overall uh, strength and bankability of the frameworks in the years ahead. 
Currently, the IEA is estimating that there's an increase of somewhere around 80 gigawatts of new non-hydro renewable capacity in sub-Saharan Africa alone by 2040. And if you follow the IEA's forecast in renewable energy and other areas over the years globally, um, they've consistently been conservative on their forecast. And there's a good chance that this forecast for Africa may well also prove to be conservative. So there's a prospect of a very significant pipeline of projects coming online in the years ahead. And part of that is driven by the spread of targets across the continent. So here's the current status, uh, excluding South Africa. This is just for the sub-Saharan um, segment. You can see that, interestingly, as of 2015, the Geothermal actually represents about two gigawatts, or about over 50% of the uh, total capacity in the pipeline, with another share of roughly 30% for solar and 20% for wind power. Um, that's primarily concentrated in the northeastern part of uh, and eastern parts of Africa. Um, that is likely to change in the years ahead as the geothermal resources are tapped and as wind and solar. Uh, in particular, continue to scale up. And if you look at it on a country basis, you can see that three countries dominate the market. Ethiopia, Kenya, and Ghana currently represent over 90% of the total uh, renewable energy projects in the pipeline. Again, this is likely to change in the years ahead as markets like Nigeria, uh, in particular, start to scale up. But this provides a bit of a snapshot of where we are today. It's, un it's important not to think of targets in isolation. Targets are always just one component of the overall landscape, of the overall framework conditions for renewable energy finance. And investing in renewable energy projects in Africa, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, faces numerous challenges. There's higher political and regulatory risk in many cases, higher sovereign credit risk, We've seen this with a couple of downgrades that have either been mooted or uh, implemented recently. Higher off-taker risk, so that ultimately refers to the utility that's buying the power in what financial health, or how is the financial health of that utility and how solvent are they to meet their long-term off-take agreements and obligations. There's also a shortage of long-term capital. Uh, it's very difficult in many parts of Africa to find, for example, debt uh, ten tenured for longer than seven or eight years. In some cases, it's difficult to find it for five years. So local banks have been very hesitant to offer uh, to provide long-term finance, and that has increased reliance on international uh, financial institutions, and in particular, um, international development finance. There's also importantly, a lack of liquid currency markets. In a lot of cases, this has really limited the ability to finance in local currency at all. Um, if there isn't a sufficiently liquid currency, currency market with the ability to buy and trade currency in different time intervals, it's very difficult to get uh, local currency denominated finance to happen at scale. It can work for small projects, maybe up to 100 kilowatts or a few hundred kilowatts, even into the low megawatts, uh, but it's very difficult to mobilize for significant transactions, so in the 50 to 100 megawatt range. And that, that's an ongoing challenge in, in a number of markets across Africa. And as I pointed out a few moments ago, there's also greater exposure to economic shocks, especially foreign exchange risk and inflation risk. And we've seen that in, particularly in South Africa and Nigeria recently, though the problem is fairly widespread across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. So this puts a broader emphasis on de-risking. And UNDP has been doing some terrific work on de-risking in, in recent years. I, I've included here one report at the bottom that they've done on Tunisia, uh, looking at de-risking and NAMAs in, uh, in the Tunisian context. And I, I think there's, there's a growing need for more discussion on uh, systematic de-risking 
both on the public side as well as on the on the sort of investment side. And ultimately, it's it, renewable energy targets can be seen as part of that, can be seen as one of many de-risking measures. So now, shifting to the functions of our targets. The first I've listed here is ultimately attracting investment. For many governments across Africa, if not most governments, the priority is trying to mobilize uh, direct foreign direct investment into the economy. And in order to do that, establishing a target can help send a signal to investors, can help put a country on the map, and can help in getting that, that initial pipeline of projects or project applications, uh, either for feed-in tariff policies in the country or auctions or tendering policies that are launched. So targets are sort of, uh, can be seen in some ways as a bit of a primer uh, to prime the market and get, uh, and get things going, or at least increase attention on the potential opportunities for investment. Targets also provide a clear signal of political commitment that there is a strategy in place and that renewables are going to be part of that. And at some level, that sign of political commitment is, is in and of itself important. And depending on how credible that commitment is, it can actually play an important role in, particularly for lenders uh, who are looking at the long-term viability of different infrastructure investments in a given market. So a, a legal a target that's ens enshrined in law helps provide that, that clear sign of political commitment that can be instrumental in mobilizing finance. As I pointed out briefly, targets can also be seen as a de-risking measure. Uh, they can reduce a number of key investment risks. They can help to mobilize, and they can help to anchor a range of policies and facilitate long-term planning. So if you're, uh, for example, operating it within the utility in a given country. When the government establishes a long-term renewable energy target, it can help the utility better undertake its own planning and its own organize its own priorities in relation to uh, electricity sector master plans. So if there's a renewable energy target in place, that can directly impact the way the long-term planning is conducted. It can force new technologies or new options onto the table that may not have been considered before, and it can drive a more balanced consideration of the actual cost competitiveness of different technologies. A decade ago, the argument was much more difficult to make when both wind and solar were considerably more expensive, particularly solar. But as the cost of renewable energy have come down, it's increasingly important for uh, regulators, policymakers, as well as utilities to conduct that kind of benchmarking analysis to look at what the cost competitiveness of different technologies are in their long-term planning. And a renewable energy target can be one way to force that onto the agenda and uh, in the process help ensure that ratepayers are ultimately supplied with the most cost-effective power possible. In many cases, what we're seeing is that solar in particular is starting to become, uh, in many markets, the most cost competitive solution for, for near term power supply. And in contrast to large hydro or even geothermal projects, which can take anywhere from five to 10 years uh, in planning and construction, large scale solar PV projects can be brought online in less than a year. Uh, in some cases, as little as six months with the right regulatory and permitting processes in place. So in light of the need for more reliable power supply in many parts of Africa, and in light of the need for continued scale up in the power sector and continued investment, uh, renewable energy targets can actually be seen as a way to also accelerate the scale of electrification and energy access. Targets can also be used to drive 
another, a range of different policy reforms at the same time. So a target doesn't stand alone. It can help drive the establishment of grid codes. We've seen this in the case of certain West, uh, Cap Verde and Ghana come to mind. It can help efforts around electricity restructuring, particularly unbundling the generation side so that there can be more competition uh, on, the, on the generation side. This can be seen in the establishment, for example, of the West African Power Pool or the East African Power Pool, where the long-term view is ultimately greater competition between generators and a more liber liberalized market. And part of, I think, renewable energy projects or renewable energy targets can be seen as supporting that insofar as they allow new actors, new investors, new IPPs to enter the market and, uh, and participate. In the most recent initiatives in West Africa, renewable energy targets have been coupled with energy efficiency targets. So we've seen uh, the adoption of these National Renewable Energy Action Plans and National Energy Efficiency Action Plans. And both of them can be seen as critical parts of energy strategy for many countries, if not all countries across Africa in the years ahead. So you can see that the targets can help or can be implemented in conjunction with a range of parallel policy efforts, including energy efficiency. In many cases, targets are also in relation to or in conjunction with either feed-in tariffs, uh, as we've seen recently and in, in ongoing in Uganda, or auctions, uh, as we see, for example, in the case of South Africa and in Zambia and Senegal. So there is a targets can help set that frame. And then complementary policies like FITs or auctions can help actually the market and help turn those targets into specific investable projects. But as I pointed out briefly uh, a few moments ago, in order for targets to do those various functions or achieve those functions, they have to be seen to be credible. And as was seen in, in many cases, and as we continue to see in many countries around the world, targets don't necessarily mean a rapid scale up in investment. There's a whole lot of things that need to happen in between in order to ensure that targets can actually uh, investments in the market. As was pointed out in the, the IRENA report that I mentioned at the outset, uh, renewable energy targets deriving only from this tend to be fragile. So if there isn't sort of a broader base of states and actors supporting the adoption and the implementation of the targets, the targets may not, may not be credible and therefore may not have very much effect on attracting investment or even on signaling. So it's really important that the targets themselves are seen to be credible. And part of what this presentation about is to try to outline some of the ways in which countries, particularly in Africa, where the need for investment in the power sector is so significant, uh, some of the ways in which those targets can be made more credible. So, part three. This is broken down into seven different principles. And I'll try to go through these one by one. Most targets around the world remain aspirational. That's just a, another way of saying non-binding or sort of voluntary. They're not, in many cases, backed by effective policies. And in most cases, they're not legally binding. So you might ask, well, what's the point then of a target that's not binding? Uh, then it's just a, a political statement without any, without any implementation. And this is what I've come to refer to as paper targets. Paper targets are one of the most problematic aspects of the renewable energy landscape uh, today. There are many countries that have very ambitious targets on paper that are failing to follow through on those. And I, I think that 
on the one hand, that delegitimizes or, or discredits to some degree the important role that targets can play, but it's also a sign of political failure. The, the inability to follow through on specific policies and laws that have been either proposed uh, or adopted in the past. National utilities in many government, in many cases, are often perceived to block progress uh, towards achieving renewable energy targets, or even block the implementation of the targets to begin with. Sometimes this is maybe this can be argued to be intentional. Uh, in other cases, it's just due to inertia or inaction on the part of utilities. Sometimes doing nothing is actually uh, in itself doing something, in that insofar as it fails to create the on-ramps, fails to create the kinds of conditions necessary for new projects to connect to the grid and to participate. So the first key principle is to move away from paper targets and make targets binding with clear consequences for failing to achieve them. And I'll outline in, in a, later in the presentation a few ways in which some of the in which targets can be made uh, more binding, what kinds of consequences could be implemented or can or have been implemented in other jurisdictions around the world to try to increase the credibility and bindingness, if you will, of targets. You can see from this spectrum, um, which we developed in this in the IRENA report uh, on setting renewable energy targets last year, that targets can be broken down into four different categories, basically along a spectrum. On the one hand, there's sort of political announcements or, or general vision statements. These are often embodied either in a press release or a white paper uh, that outlines an intention to, to adopt maybe 20% renewables or 30% renewables in the, in the energy or electricity mix. But many of those political announcements are just are just that. They're not supported by specific policies, they're not sp supported by specific regulations, and they often don't lead to any meaningful transformation in the energy mix. The second part of the spectrum is where those vision statements are translated into actual strategies. This might be integrated resource plans or electricity master plans. But again, if you look across Africa, for any, anyone who's worked with, with regulators and, and policy makers across Africa, the follow through on master plans is often uh, incomplete. And many of the aspects or many of the elements of the master plans simply don't get adopted or don't get implemented. They're in the document, so you can go back and find the master plan that outlined all these terrific things that were going to be done. Uh, but the actual follow-through is, is often not there. And that comes down to whether the targets or whether the, the goals outlined are actually binding or not, or whether they're just voluntary and aspirational. The third one is where these energy strategies become converted into actual action plans. And we see this currently taking place in West Africa, where some of the where the 15 ECOWAS member states, for example, are in conjunction with ECRI and, and a range of other partners, are starting to adopt the various components of their national renewable energy action plans. You can see in the action plans a much greater level of detail, uh, a clearer focus on policies and implementation, and even uh, the introduction recently of what what's been called the investment prospectus that actually outlines a set of investable projects that can be uh, tabled in order to attract investment in the country, in the, in the, in the power sector or in the energy sector more broadly. So you can see throughout each of these that there's an increasing degree of specificity, measurability, but also of bindingness. How binding are they? And in the fourth and final part of the spectrum is where we find legally binding renewable energy targets. 
Those are typically enshrined in law, and they come with clear penalties for noncompliance. And the penalties can take, as I pointed out, a, a range of different forms. In some cases, the penalties involve, in, for example, in the case of the U.S., utilities that don't comply may have their allowed return on investment, their sort of regulated return on investment, brought down a notch. Or they may face actual cash penalties for each day that they are short of reaching the target uh, in the year. Or it may even involve a specific penalty for each megawatt hour or gigawatt hour shortfall uh, from the target in a given year. And those penalties can help encourage the utilities that are responsible for meeting them to comply. Another approach that can be used in relation to making targets more binding is actually to make management responsible, to make management accountable for meeting the targets. So if there is a credible threat that a utility executive, for example, will lose their job, will be replaced if they fail to, to meet the, the regulations or meet the, the targets set out, then you can start to create the right incentives to ensure that the utility takes, the utility management itself takes the target seriously and takes specific measures to make sure that it's met uh, on time. So ultimately, I think it's, it's, there are various ways of enforcing compliance. There are various compliance cultures to encouraging uh, renewable energy targets to be met or targets of any kind to be met. But fundamentally, it comes down to creating the right incentives to ensure that the progress is being made and to ensure that uh, there's consequences for, for falling short or for dropping the ball. And I think that's really at the heart of, of this discussion. The second point, there's a recent book that introduces the distinction, I think quite a powerful distinction and one that uh, we'll likely still be discussing decades hence between inclusive and extractive institutions. Inclusive institutions foster participation and feedback from different actors, different entities, different par parties in society. They ensure a level, a level playing field so that anybody can, can participate, and they help introduce the right kinds of incentives to ensure that, uh, economic, that the economy can develop more effectively and with less, less corruption and less um, um, preferential treatment. And that's in contrast to extractive institutions that are seen to uh, monopolize or control power, excessively centralize that power, and often um, contribute to far higher shares of, of corruption that ultimately don't contribute to the economic uh, prosperity of, of the country. And Asa Mogun Robinson in, in their book lay out a whole range of different examples from across Africa, from across Asia, from across um, even the Americas and Europe of where different institutions have failed uh, in, in being sufficiently inclusive and what consequences that has had. And I think there's a lot of important lessons in there for uh, both for policymakers in general in Africa, but also for anyone working in, in development. So the second key principle is institutions matter. Renewable energy targets are likely to be achieved far more quickly and efficiently when the institutions that govern them are accountable and have clear rules and procedures that apply evenly to all participants and when those rules themselves are relatively and procedures are relatively transparent. So at the, at the heart of this is making sure that not only is a target in place, but that the target is accompanied by a set of policies and procedures that ensure a level playing field.
The third point is that in order to monitor progress, it's necessary to have a baseline. So as was seen in the climate, the various climate targets going back to Kyoto, governments adopted a baseline year. And this baseline year differs depending on, depending on the country. It differs yet again uh, with the, the agreement recently announced in Paris in December. But fundamentally, establishing a baseline and gathering the core, core baseline data is critical. This is accompanied or needs to be accompanied by some form of regular reporting. Typically, in, at least in the renewable energy sector, uh, as well as in the climate sector, this is done with some form of annual progress report. So having clear baseline data that says where we are today and annual reports that update over time. A key part of this and a key reason for this principle is on the one hand transparency, but on the other is to help keep everyone's eyes on the ball. If there isn't that kind of regular reporting, it's very, very easy for either the policymakers or regulators within the country or the citizens or the various businesses even operating within the country to just lose sight or lose track of what's actually going on uh, and to not focus. So the function, one of the functions of an annual report is that it helps maintain uh, both the public pressure, but also it helps keep people focused on the objective. The fourth principle relates to accountability. In many countries, and this isn't just in Africa, but in, in many countries around the world, there's little or, or very or even no capacity in place to monitor and report on that progress. In many cases, there are few or no institutions that are responsible for publishing annual reports. In some cases, it's just voluntarily left up to the regulator. And the regulator often has multiple different priorities and may be short-staffed, uh, may have too many responsibilities, may have other training or capacity building uh, that takes priority. And in many cases, that kind of annual credible reporting simply doesn't get done. Now, there's been a lot of work uh, done on this by and in conjunction with um, international donors. And I think that's one, certainly one positive area where uh, where more effort is, is needed to ensure that there is this uh, annual reporting and data gathering going on. On the one hand, this kind of progress monitoring fosters greater accountability because you can actually point when a, a given jurisdiction has fallen short, but it also helps promote public awareness because the annual report can be covered in the media and by being covered in the media can be discussed more widely and can help uh, individual, for example, business groups to put more pressure on the government to step it up or to improve their policies or regulations. So in that sense, progress report isn't only useful for investors or for civil society. It's also really important for the government itself so that it knows uh, when improvements are needed or so that it can identify actually what needs to be improved in order to get the market growing in a way that's consistent with the targets established. So the fifth principle relates to how specific and precise the targets are. There have been many debates around the world around the precise definition of the target and what the various lawmakers or regulators meant when they wrote energy or electricity or the share of uh, in the law or the regulations that establish the target. In some cases, the target is defined specifically in absolute terms, so in a specific number of gigawatt hours that has to be generated or percentage-based. Uh, a specific percentage of total energy consumption or total electricity consumption. But there's also further nuances. It can be important to distinguish between whether it's referring to final energy consumption or primary energy consumption, 
also whether it relates to electricity or energy more broadly. In many cases, the laws are simply set out and referred to energy, when really what's meant is electricity. And some of those nuances may not seem that important on the surface, but when it comes down to the actual legal or regulatory intent, it can become critical. A further distinction is between whether it's on final electricity or, or energy output or sales. So in other words, does this monitor the number of gigawatt hours produced by wind and solar and hydro and biomass projects and geothermal projects across the country? Or does it refer to the actual share of renewable energy in final electricity sales that reach end users, that reach customers? And again, that can seem like a fairly uh, abstract nuance, but it actually can have a very significant impact on the total magnitude of the target. So in some cases, if the target is set in just at the, at the power plant, the bus bar level, or just in terms of output, the target may be 20 times or 20 percent or even 30 percent smaller than it would be if it were on final electricity sales due to losses in the distribution and transmission system. So the trend, uh, certainly in the US and, and increasingly in Europe, is for the targets themselves to be set as a percentage of final electricity sales or actual consumption in the market, uh, rather than on just output. Um, and that's again partly because of the desire, the need for more regulatory and legal certainty. So the more binding the targets become, the more important these kinds of provisions become. A related point is that instead of, rather than having a simple long-term target set out for 2030 or even 2040, uh, as is often the case, it can be very helpful both for the government as well as for investors for the target to be broken down into interim steps, into incremental steps, either on an annual basis, every three years, or every five years, so that there's some greater degree of uh, resolution in, in the target itself. I think that can be really important, and you can see this in, for example, in US RPSs, where the, the long-term target is broken down into a series of individual annual targets. And that helps, again, improve clarity, improve the overall planning certainty, but it also helps uh, in making the target itself more robust and fundamentally more credible. So the fifth principle is making targets precise and clear, as well as staged or stepped over time. The sixth. the sixth principle relates to the grid and the associated infrastructure. We've seen in a number of countries in recent years the development of renewable energy projects moving well ahead of the development of transmission capacity. Not only is that embarrassing, uh, but it's also unnecessary, sort of an, what's called an unforced error in sports. You know, if you're making if you were in a position where the planning procedures should have been in place, could have been in place to ensure that transmission capacity was there, permitting the projects before the capacity is being built is not a good idea because the projects need far less time to be developed than the transmission capacity. So if we're, we're talking about large scale, particularly large scale projects, having a clear set of protocols, a clear planning process for transmission expansion, including its own financing and, and uh, both equity and debt related financing provisions in place, that it's going to be very hard to reach the target on time because large projects need certainty over the ability to export their power into the system. And this applies whether it's in wind projects in Kenya or geothermal projects in Ethiopia or uh, solar projects in Cap Verde 
more wind projects in Cap Verde for that matter. Fundamentally, there needs to be access to the grid, and the grid needs to be there and be sufficiently reliable to accommodate that power. And curtailment has already emerged as a huge issue in both European and US power markets. And I think it, I would venture that it's going to be and going to remain one of the most important aspects of uh, ensuring bankability in Africa in, in the years ahead for new projects being built. Part of that relates to broader issues around reliability of the grid. If the grid isn't sufficiently reliable and the power can't be delivered, what does that mean for either the achievement of the target you know, is the target actually still met if that power can't, it is curtailed? And what does it mean in terms of um, the actual end user and the share of the actual energy mix or the actual power system mix in the system? So ensuring that the infrastructure is there and that the ongoing improvements are made in both transmission and distribution infrastructure are a key part of successful implementation of an achievement of renewable energy targets. So the sixth key principle, don't forget about the grid. And the seventh and final principle is and centers around stakeholder engagement. Targets that are imposed without stakeholder engagement often lack legitimacy and often don't get very good uptake. We've seen several positive examples of stakeholder consultations in recent years, and I think there's some great, uh, great literature, great examples, and great um, websites from these various regulators and agencies on how they went about their public consultations on the targets. And I've cited a few here, Morocco, South Africa, and some countries in the ECOWAS region uh, come to mind, though there are certainly others. Um, another good example would be Tunisia. Fundamentally, stakeholder consultations are critical to build that legitimacy, improve the credibility of the target, and ensure that there is mobilization taking place to achieve it. So all of this is part of uh, a deeper process that needs to build up over time. And part of creating that buildup involves engaging with stakeholders. So, concluding remarks. Be firm on the vision, but flexible on the details. I think fundamentally, it doesn't matter what the precise number either of countries that have targets or of the target number itself, whether it's 30% or 40% or in the case of Cabo Verde, 100%. What matters is the underlying institutional environment that supports the achievement of those targets. And in many cases, we've seen the actual details of the target themselves change. So in South Africa's integrated resource plan from 2011-12, there was virtually no mention of solar. Solar was not included in explicitly with its own capacity target in the integrated resource plan. And then during the public consultations, it was brought to the attention of, of both regulators and, the, and decision makers that solar should be, should be included, not only because it, you know, technological diversity has its advantages, but also because solar was actually increasingly cost competitive in South Africa. And when they went back to the drawing board and evaluated the costs, South Africa significantly increased the amount of capacity allocated, uh, allocating a few gigawatts of capacity to PV projects instead of the, the zero that had been allotted in the previous IRP. So the, ultimately the details of the targets are likely to change as technology costs change, but also as the greater awareness of resources and availability and of which projects are most investable or which projects have the most motivated backers 
um, becomes clear. And as that happens, there needs to be a process in place for the target itself to be uh, adapted or adjusted over time. So the target itself, the overall objective of decarbonization, of transitioning to more local renewable sources in the power mix can remain, but ultimately the details of how that particular target are reached is reached uh, can change and often should change as new information comes to light. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Great, thank you so much, Toby. Um, our first question here is, um, given the different uh, countries' different legal and regulatory history, how can countries make targets more binding, and uh, what kind of penalties could they implement? Huh. I think in you know, a lot of countries, it's going to be hard to establish the kind of um, the kind of penalty architecture that you have in the United States, for example, where there's a long tradition of public utility commissions um, regulating the, the utilities, either publicly owned or privately owned, within the state. And without that kind of a regulatory tradition, uh, it may be necessary for decision makers to be a, a bit more um, creative or to adopt different means of of ensuring that the targets are met. So in many cases in Africa, it may not be credit, it may not be viable to introduce penalties, um, partly because those penalties, if the utility can just pass on the costs of those penalties onto ratepayers, then the government takes the political heat for that. So if the government lev lev levies significant fines on um, the STEG, for example, in Tunisia, which is the utility responsible for the majority of the power mix in Tunisia, then in all likelihood they would just pass that cost on to ratepayers rather than it materially impacting uh, their operations or their profitability. So a simple penalty actually may not work uh, in the way that it might in other traditions where um, where the penalty can be levied more or can be restricted or ring-fenced more specifically on uh, shareholders. So in those kinds of environments, the more effective or one of the more effective ways of approaching the problem of, of penalties or of compliance might be to, for the, as I pointed out, for the threat of someone losing their position, losing their job over the failure to, to achieve the target. If managers actually believe, managers of utilities um, actually believe that their job is on the line and that reaching this target is a matter of national importance, national energy security, national economic development, uh, national economic diversification, if the target is taken sufficiently seriously and there's a credible threat that they could lose their job for failing to meet it, uh, that's likely to help significantly in focusing people's attention. Um, and that may be a, another a sort of an alternative and potentially more politically popular way of encouraging uh, utilities to meet the targets than the, the kind of penalties um, levied in certain cases in uh, in the US, for example. So ultimately, as I pointed out briefly, this comes down to a question of different compliance cultures or enforcement cultures. And it really, um, it's important not to sort of copy and paste what has worked, for example, in, in North America um, or elsewhere into into Africa. I think local local solutions are best. I, I've suggested one potential avenue, but certainly not um, certainly not the only one. Um, great. And speaking of targets, in uh, in your experience, are the targets typically focused 
focused on utility scale projects or do they extend to off-grid strategies such as mini-grids or SHS? Yeah, so we actually, there have been many countries uh, across Africa that have targets for both utility scale and off-grid and even in some cases mini-grid uh, projects with specific numbers, uh, specific either percentage numbers or capacity numbers attached. So one example that comes to mind is Rwanda. Uh, in Rwanda, there are national targets for the sort of IPP market segment, solar home systems, as well as for mini-grid, uh, sort of renewable hybrid mini-grids. Uh, and I think that's a great template because ultimately just focusing on the IPP market is probably too narrow. Um, a lot of the future power needs, future electrification needs in Africa are concentrated in, in remote and sort of peri-urban or, or non-urban uh, areas. And um, encouraging investment in those kinds of projects, uh, setting targets for those kinds of projects, I think um, can certainly help bring more attention to them and help them get the financing they need. Thank you. And um, another question that came in is asking for uh, some clarification on the principle two dealing with inclusive versus uh, extractive institutions. Could you just uh, expand on that a little bit? Sure. Um, so the, the book is, is called Why Nations Fail. And it looks at, it uses that distinction as a way to understand uh, the economic development and, and prosperity of nations. So it looks at, for example, to focus on one case of extractive institutions, uh, perhaps the most famous, uh, most notorious is the institution of slavery, where the direct extraction of human labor was done in order to enrich a very small se segment of society. And the same happens in many cases in the mining or mineral sector today, where a, a very valuable resource is, is extracted in order to benefit a very, very few, and in order to protect the power of, the, of a very few within, within society. And this has happened over centuries and millennia, as they, they detail, uh, not only in Africa, but also in, in jurisdictions around the world, including UK and um, parts of many parts of Asia, those kinds of power structures are what they characterize as extractive in that they are based on extracting the value or extracting some form of value or wealth from uh, one subset of society in order to benefit a, a few. And inclusive institutions are the kind that allow broad participation in economic activity and that aren't based fundamentally on extraction but are based more on sort of distributed wealth wealth creation. That would be creating fair rules for small business um, small business development rather than having one you know national entity responsible for example for all charcoal production or all um, electricity production in, in the case of energy. So inclusive institutions are about creating the kinds of environments that allow or that establish a level playing field, that allow multiple different actors to share power and to participate in economic growth and prosperity. And the argument is that at the core, what defines successful, prosperous nations from less successful ones is the extent to which their institutions are inclusive. And I think in the, I've picked up on this in, in the discussion around targets and in particular in focusing on Africa because I think the, the fundamental insight is, is quite a powerful one and is one that is useful uh, for the power sector. If you look at the example of Germany and the four utilities that pre previously dominated the power sector, 
with the introduction of both ambitious renewable energy targets, but also uh, the feed-in tariff in Germany, you saw a very rapid diversification of the energy supply system, where there are now over 1.2 individual, uh, 1.2 million individual solar producers, in contrast to the four entities that used to own uh, virtually all generation across the country. So through that diversification, you have a sharing of power, both in the figurative sense as well as in the literal sense, in that more individuals and businesses can participate in the power system, in the electricity system, in the energy system more broadly. And that has powerful effects. In Germany uh, and in many other countries, the ability to participate not only increases the political legitimacy of the targets or the objective, it also increases the ability of individuals in the country to, to prosper or to benefit uh, from that and have more disposable income that they can then reinvest and support future economic uh, growth and diversification. So there's very much uh, what the two authors refer to as a, a virtuous circle or virtuous cycle that takes root when the institutions are fundamentally inclusive. And I'm sure you can find online uh, great summaries of, uh, of the book, and they've no doubt published articles in, in a range of different platforms uh, summarizing the key, the key points. But I, I think the message carries important insights for um, both for renewable energy targets and an energy strategy, but also for, uh, for Africa in particular. Great. And uh, our next question is about uh, stakeholders and just uh, who are the different types of stakeholders to be engaged that you mentioned in Principle 7 uh, to make successful renewable energy targets? And uh, the second part of that is which factors made Morocco, South Africa good examples of stakeholder engagement? So some of the key stakeholders, obviously, I mean, the utility or utilities need to be at the table. Um, targets are unlikely to be adopted if they don't have buy-in from, from the key actors. Uh, this has been one problem in, um, in many countries. If the largest utilities aren't part of the discussion, they don't feel included in the discussion, they tend to drag their feet at every chance they get uh, because they haven't been consulted and they feel that it goes against their their long-term um, their existing long-term planning so they're obviously the most uh, perhaps the most pivotal and the most obvious but there are also some other less obvious ones uh, anyone operating or responsible for the power grid needs to be involved I mentioned briefly the West African power pool as well as the Eastern African uh, some of the new agencies and entities emerging around that certainly need to be part of the discussion. Um, investors that have expressed interest need to be part of that discussion. Citizens obviously need to be part of, of any discussion around, um, around these topics and making forums and conferences uh, available to, to citizens and to business owners uh, can be a really important way of building building some of that momentum and public awareness and public credibility. Um, another important um, set of groups is obviously the business associations. There are a range of different business associations that often are vocal on a range of different issues. Having them involved can also be important in helping mobilize um, more investment. There may be companies in the country that aren't currently interested or currently investing in renewable energy that actually have quite strong balance sheets and that may be uh, a very good candidate for, for investing in the power system or in power system infrastructure or generation um, that haven't been involved before. So there may be a way to get some of those actors involved. And on that note, it also it can be other other parallel sectors like the telecommunications sector or the hotel sector. 
uh, where there's significant potential for um, both distributed as well as larger scale renewable energy investments to take place. So engaging broadly um, is critical. Uh, one final group relates to some of the, the different agencies that are already involved in many countries, uh, international agencies, whether um, the African Development Bank, the IFC and World Bank, UNEP, UNDP, um, some of the European agencies, GIZ. Uh, I think having some of those key partners at the table can be really important in um, both in the awareness side and creating a more important signal and helping spread that signal to to other uh, other potential investors, but it can also help uh, support some of the training needs that emerge. So in order to achieve a target, it may be necessary to significantly improve grid integration protocols, for example, and the way that renewable energy is uh, actually integrated into the system. That can involve a host of different technical changes, uh, both in the system architecture, but also in the procedures, the institutional procedures around the way power is dispatched. And for some of that, uh, it can be very helpful to have targeted uh, training support. So um, having some of those agencies and entities at the table can be, can be important, and not, not just for the traditional reasons of, uh, of providing co-financing, uh, but also for training and capacity building. And uh, to the second question around Morocco and South Africa, um, I'll just focus briefly on South Africa. Uh, they underwent uh, a range of stakeholder sessions, both to identify things like uh, geographic, sort of the geographic side of the equation. So where in South Africa can or are the best renewable energy resources found? Where is the land rights regime clearest? Where, for example, large wind farms or large solar projects uh, could be built? And it, it's difficult to imagine how that land, these land-based questions could be clarified without direct stakeholder engagement with, with both uh, public authorities and um, landowners that are affected by this. So South Africa underwent a broad process, both sort of on the resource assessment side, but also on the kind of land rights and land access side in order to um, clarify some of those questions and help identify where uh, a series of zones where renewable energy projects can be most effectively or most efficiently built. Um, so, that was all coordinated um, with the help of, of different agencies, but sort of championed or quarterbacked by, um, by the government. And that's just one example. There are many um, that could be pointed to, but those are, that's, that's one in particular that comes to mind. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is dealing with um, extremely rural areas and uh, poverty. How can we engage governments, donors, and private sector to prioritize targets around energy po poverty at an extreme level? Well, if, if the um, International Energy Agency is to be believed, for every one dollar of power sector investment um, in energy access that's made, it translates into a fifteen dollar benefit or fifteen dollar impact on GDP. So if countries across Africa really start taking energy access seriously, not just as a, as a sort of uh, a form of noblesse oblige, uh, from from the authorities that sit in the capital, but as an actual economic development strategy, um, I think the, the potential is tremendous for rural regions across Africa to, to lead the way. Um, I think it does take a deeper appreciation of some of the direct and indirect benefits of 
both of electrification of energy access um, in particular, but also just of, of renewable energy in general uh, in these regions. And if that isn't appreciated or if that isn't fully understood by decision makers, it's unlikely to get the kind of priority that it, that it perhaps deserves. So if you can get key decision makers to really grasp, really understand the significant economic multipliers and positive benefits that come from, positive economic benefits that come from uh, improved electrification, it doesn't necessarily need to be seen as a, um, just a, a negative or a sort of cost item on the government's balance sheet. Uh, it, or a cost item specifically in their, in their government planning. It can be seen as a direct investment in, in their future economic growth and, and prosperity. And I think that's where the discussion on electrification, on energy access needs to go. Uh, I think it's not just about um, trying to find new new business models or new financing that can scale up, though that's obviously at the heart of this challenge. Um, in order for, the, for that sector to get the attention it needs, um, decision makers need to, full, need to more fully appreciate uh, the extent of those multipliers and how positive improving energy access ultimately is uh, for the economy. I think that's one way to get um, electrification targets directly within the, either the renewable energy targets or within the master plans. Um, on the other hand, I think it may be fair to say that uh, it may not be necessary to have a target for every, you know, for every village or for every um, sector and subsector. I think in the off-grid space, um, the economics are already leading the way. It is already more economic to power villages and communities and households with solar uh, PV than it is with diesel, even at today's oil prices. So in many of these areas, uh, the, the economics are already overwhelmingly in favor of a renewable energy pathway. So the need for specific renewable energy targets in the traditional sense um, may become less and less important because renewables are actually the cheapest way to do it. Um, what then becomes more important is the business models and the provisions around how this is financed and how the tariff structures are designed and how can you make those tariffs affordable uh, to end users. And even if it's cheaper than diesel, it doesn't mean that it's affordable for um, communities to have the kind of the level of power use that they might have in the city. So there needs to be um, power supply in, in remote areas is, is by definition more expensive. And um, that needs to be reflected ultimately in the kinds of the kinds of systems and the kinds of tariff structures uh, that are established. So I, ho I hope that answers um, that answers the question. Great, thank you. Um, and we have uh, one last question before we head into uh, closing remarks. Uh, based on uh, your experience working on renewable energy projects in Africa, which source of renewable energy do you think has so far been the most successful on the continent? Huh. Um, I mean, in absolute terms, um, if you define renewable energy broadly, biomass takes the cake. Um, biomass represents by far, by which, by that I mean sort of wood um, or dung related you know, for cooking purposes uh, represents in many countries over 90 percent of the total energy mix. I mean it, it is on the overwhelmingly largest contributor to to the energy to the overall energy mix um, in many cases. So broadly speaking I think you could say well biomass is the <laughs> it takes the cake at least for now. Um, but the more important question is looking forward. Uh, what's what's more likely. And I think while uh, Africa, more broadly, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has tremendous potential in geothermal, 
has tremendous potential in hydro uh, and also has quite robust wind resources in certain regions. I think in the long term, um, the future is solar. Uh, I think the majority of the power mix in 100 years uh, in Africa will be solar. I, I don't think there's any um, any technology that's as scalable and as cost-effective, um, particularly given the existing composition of, of the African power system. I mean, if you building transmission is often and is increasingly the most expensive part of electrification. It's not the generation side, and as PV and wind get cheaper, and particularly PV. Uh, that ratio is going to get worse and worse. It was going to get more and more in favor of distributed approaches. So it may not make sense to build 20 gigawatt uh, hydro dams or even two gigawatt geothermal plants when you have to transport that power over hundreds if not thousands of kilometers um, because when you take that combined investment, the centralized pathway may be far more expensive than the decentralized one. So in terms of following that logic, then the future is increasingly to what can be most easily decentralized. And while you know, wind is, is decentralized to a degree, um, you're still talking about minimum project sizes of typically of sort of 10 megawatts and above, whereas PV can be scaled down to the, to the sort of pico scale. Um, so in light of that flexibility, in light of that scalability, um, and just in, in light of the fact that solar is the most widespread, most sort of equitably distributed energy resource uh, across Africa, um, it's likely to be the, the defining technology um, in, in boosting access and in, in achieving renewable energy targets in the years ahead, even if that's not the case in many, many energy targets or many energy strategies today, uh, I think it increasingly will be and increasingly um, should be if economics uh, dictate. Thank you. Um, well, those are all the questions that we've received. Uh, if anyone else would like to submit another question, you can put them, uh, enter it in the questions pane on the toolbar, and we can always send them after the webinar. Um, Toby, would you like to add any closing remarks before we continue on to the survey? Um, sure. Well, I guess one closing thought. I think the at the heart of this, you know, renewable energy targets are just the framing. They aren't what goes inside. And they are important at sort of setting the stage, but fundamentally a lot of work needs to be done in what goes inside that target. You know, what are the specific, if not the majority of the work, is based on what goes inside that target. How is it structured? What kinds of policies are used to achieve it? What are the administrative procedures that are in place? What kinds of agencies have what kinds of responsibilities over uh, making what kinds of decisions within the jurisdiction to achieve the target? I mean, that's really where uh, most important work remains to be done. So I think from a you know, media standpoint, often a lot of attention is placed on the magnitude of the target. You know, is it 20% or is it 30% or is it 50%? Um, from at least in my experience, I think the, the number is far less important than the institutional underpinnings. And I think any, particularly in the light of the, the ongoing um, NREAPs and NEAPs and the SE for all processes going on across Africa, um, I think it's really the, the attention needs to be on those institutional underpinnings, trying to get the procedures in place right so that um, the right investability can be established, but also so that the, some of the key risks can be, can be addressed and can be de-risked uh, in the process. So um, I'll leave it at that. 
thank you so much. And uh, now we would like to send out a brief survey to the attendees. And the first question that we have for you uh, is, the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight. And please select on the screen if you strongly agree, agree, not sure, disagree, or strongly disagree. Great. Thank you. Our next question is, uh, the webinar's presenters were effective. Thank you very much. Overall, the webinar met my expectations. Thank you. Our fourth question is, do you anticipate using the information presented in this webinar directly in your work and or organization? And finally, do you anticipate applying the information presented to develop or revise policies or programs in your country of focus? Thank you so much. That is our last question. Uh, on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd like to extend a thank you to Toby Couture for attending our webinar today. We've had a terrific audience and we very much appreciate your time. I invite all of our attendees to check the Solutions Center website if you would like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentations, as well as any previously held webinars. Additionally, you will find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. We are now posting webinar recordings on the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Please allow one week for the audio recording to be posted. We also invite you to inform your colleague, colleagues and those in your networks about the Solutions Center resources and services, including our no-cost policy support. Have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. This concludes our webinar. <laughs>